So one of the first topics that I wanted to cover was woodland owner goals. And in the state of Maine, we have the freedom to do uh, as we wish, as long as we're within the bounds of the law. And one of the things that we really like to do with Maine Forest Service is talk with landowners about what their goals are. So if I own a woodlot and you own a woodlot, we may have very different ideas about what's important to us on that woodlot. Um, so the first paper that I've put up here is a Woodland Owner Goals paper, and it does um, have some questions that I think are really good for people to go through. Uh, just to think a little bit about their woodland and, and what it is that makes them tick, what makes the woodland itself work. Um, so thinking about things like how long have I owned this property? How did I get it? Is it something that I went and purchased because I just fell in love with it? Or is it something I inherited from my family? Is it really meeting my goals because of that? Um, you might manage things a little bit differently if you live on the property or if you are more than two hours away. Obviously, if you live on the property, you can go out there almost any time. And if you're further away, you might not get to your woodlot quite as often. So management might be a little bit different. Thinking about how often you're actually out there in the woods and what you'd like to do while you're out there, that informs your management decisions as well. A um, lot of people around here like to hunt and fish. So maybe you're thinking more about managing your woodlot to get a specific um, critter out there. And we actually, uh, I think it's the fourth meeting, we'll be having a wildlife biologist. Um, IFNW has a new wildlife biologist who is doing landowner outreach. So um, be very exciting to have him come and talk with us. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> Do you have equipment? That's another big question that we like to talk about when we're out there. Do you have an ATV? Can you move some of this stuff around yourself or are you gonna be entirely dependent on someone else to come in and manage the, the lot for you? Who else besides you uses your woodland? Is it open to all kinds of groups? Do you let Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts come in? Do you do, give school tours? Do you like to have things open to the general public? So you may have to think about having a gathering place or safe parking on your woodlot. And then I encourage you all to go down through question number 10 and think about what are the things that you value about your woodlot and what is most important to you? Um, are you in it to earn money? Nothing wrong with that. Or are you much more interested in camping and picnicking and maybe hiking and cross country skiing? Those kinds of questions will also inform you as when you have a harvest, because if you're um, trying to maintain your trails so that you can walk on them, then you probably don't want a processor and forwarder out there because of the way the processor cuts the wood. It drops the wood right in the trails and then it runs over the brush. So that makes it very difficult to walk on later. So these are all kinds of questions that um, the district foresters would ask, ask you if you they come out on your woodlot to walk it with you. Um, <clears throat> do you like to get firewood, make maple syrup? Um, are you thinking about a legacy for your family? What is it you want them to do after you're gone? And what activities do you think will change in the future um, because of your goals? Is there some point when you decide that you want to leave it to a land trust? Um, is it going to go to your children? Those are all really important things to think about. And I encourage you, if you are getting older and you've got um, some children who might be interested in your woodlot, to talk with them about what you have done and why you've done it, and maybe have them start become uh, part of the decision-making process for the woodlot itself. Um, it It's hard for somebody to... Uh, adhere to your goals or honor your goals if they don't know what they are. So one of the things I wanted to point out is that we have um, 10 district foresters scattered around the state. 
uh, wherever you live in the state or wherever you own property, you will be able to find a district forester to come and walk your woodlot with you. And that's a free service. It's your taxes, you're paying taxes on your property. So this is one of the services that we provide. And we highly recommend that you have this kind of visit before you commit to a forester and definitely before you have a harvest. Because sometimes um, a harvester is looking at your woodlot, thinking about maximizing your profit or his profit. And that may not be what your goal is. The, you may have very important parts of the property that you don't want to have harvested. You may think that um, there are some special trees of, of great value that you want to keep. Um, you may think nothing out there is worth anything. Um, we, I, I talk to people all the time who say, well, how much is it going to cost me to have my wood cut? And the thing is, uh, very, very rarely does it actually cost you to have your wood cut. Um, you can usually make some money on it by cutting it. Uh, the amount of money that you make depends, of course, on what you cut. And a lot of woodlots that haven't been managed very much recently um, are going to start with the type of harvest which we might call um, an improvement cut. So basically, you'd be taking out your low value trees, your low quality trees, um, perhaps trees that are really crowding much more valuable trees. So if you're cutting a lot of pulp wood, you're probably not going to make a lot of money, but you're really doing a lot to improve the value of your property. One of the reasons that I think it's really good to have a district forester come and talk with you about your goals and what's out there is that our opinions are unbiased. We're not promoting any particular mill. We're not promoting any particular forester or harvester. What we're doing is we try to talk with you, especially when we first arrive there, about what it is you like to do and what it is you think you would like to do on your woodlot. Um, I do know a guy one time who bought a lot and he said, wow, you know, I am going to have a great sugar bush out there. And I went out and I looked and I felt kind of bad for him because he really didn't know when he was purchasing the property what type of um, soils and aspect he should be having in order to have sugar maples there. And he had a very low softwood flat. And so it quickly became apparent to me that since he had purchased this to have maple syrup, he either needed to change his goals or he needed to purchase a different piece of property. So you can find the district foresters. Um, like I said, they're on this map, but I know it's probably too small for you to read their contact information. But if you go to the URL that's at the top, main.gov, DACF, MFS, policy underscore management, district underscore foresters dot HTML, that will take you to a list of all the towns in the state of Maine. And you can look at any one of the towns and you'll find out who your district forester is. Um, an even easier way to do it is go to main.gov and then just type in the tax the little search bar district foresters and that'll take you to this page. One thing I did want to point out um, the green uh, the bright green spot it says vacant but it is not vacant. We started a new district forester on the 12th of April. Um, his name is Kenny Ferguson and his contact information for those of you who live in that area um, his phone number is 215-9092. So um, we hope that you'll give him a call. I know we asked you when you signed up um, and a lot of people said that you weren't particularly interested in having a district forester come and visit, um, but you might change your mind as the class goes along. And maybe you already have a forester that you're working with, but you'd be interested in having Joe Roy, who's the wildlife biologist come and help you move a little bit more towards well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about forest terminology because I know 
Um, sometimes it can seem really technical and really confusing. Um, foresters have a lot of buzzwords and we don't even think sometimes about the fact that nobody knows what we're talking about. So um, this is a fairly short presentation, but I just wanted to talk about some of the terminology that I think is likely to come up in the presentations over the next few weeks. And uh, instead of grouping them all alphabetically, I tried to group them into categories. So the first thing I wanted to start with are um, general terms. When we're talking about the environment, we're talking about how sunlight and air and soil and the topography, meaning the hills and the valleys, um, and then something called aspect, which means which way uh, the ground is sloping, all can influence an organism's form, behavior, and survival. I'm sure you've all seen down on the coast that a lot of trees are very, very short, where inland those same trees might have um, much straighter form, they might have much larger crowns on them, and that's just because of the environment. If it's growing in better soils, if it's getting more nutrients, that tree is going to be a little bit different than um, one growing in, in a poorer soil or a wetter soil. Conservation and preservation are two terms that quite often get mixed up. Um, I talk with a lot of people who think that they want to preserve their land. And what preservation is, is really trying to keep the forest just the way it is, totally undisturbed. Um, you're hoping that you're gonna be able to control all the internal and external influences that are out there. Um, there are a lot that you can't. Windstorms, things like that, we have no control over. We can certainly control whether or not we harvest. We can control whether or not people are allowed to go onto the property and to use the property. Um, but preservation does not always lead to the healthiest state for the forest. Um, trees will die, um, they'll grow older. You may get a lot of trees growing back up that are not really species that you would want to be there. So we try to encourage people instead to go for conservation. And conservation is when you're protecting the property, you're trying not to hurt it at all, but you're also trying to improve it and you're trying to use some of those natural resources so that they will continue to roll on and you can use them and future generations will still have something healthy and helpful to use um, in the future. So that's something to keep in mind, the difference between conservation and preservation. And I hope you'll all become conservationists uh, with this class. Incentives, a um, lot of people are looking for some sort of um, financial help with their um, managing their woodlot. And Julie is going to be talking in the second segment about that. Um, but an incentive is a reward for improving forest management. And it includes reimbursement of some of the expenses that you have in maybe creating a forest management plan or creating a road, something that helps you manage the property. Um, but it also may come in the form of some sort of property tax relief or rebate. Um, We'll talk some probably about mature trees, especially when we talk about timber harvesting. And there's a difference between biological maturity and economic maturity. Um, a hemlock can live easily to be 400 years old. That would be biological maturity. But economic maturity might come 200 years before that, uh, at the point where the tree actually gets to the proper size. Um, certainly, it's fun to grow great big trees, but mills like um, Pleasant River Lumber really can't take a tree that's much larger than 22 inches because their machinery is not geared up for it. So um, you may end up cutting something a little bit earlier than what its 
um, biological maturity is because it's the time when it is the most useful at the mill or the most healthy to go to the mill. So a mature tree has re reached its desired size or age for its intended use. So. Multiple use, that's something that we really do encourage, um, especially small landowners to do. And that is managing the forest for more than one value. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive. Obviously, we can't have um, critters on the property that rely on big open spaces, as well as critters that re rely on mature closed canopy forests. Um, you know, they're not going to be in that same space. But you can talk about what uh, values you want and what animals are most appropriate to your property. And you might have timber harvesting as a goal, but you'll be thinking about perhaps wildlife habitat when you do that. Um, you might be thinking, hopefully, about water quality. Um, maybe aesthetics is important to you. you. You don't want your neighbors to look across and see that you have a had a heavy harvest, but it's just something that's, um, uh, you know, looks like maybe the trees have been thinned out a little bit. So there's nothing wrong with multiple use. And um, the one of the things that I wanted to say about that too is don't dismiss a logger out of hand just because you see a harvest that they did that you didn't like. Because remember that landowner's goal may be something very different than what your goals are. Maybe they are sending a child to college and uh, really needed the cash, or maybe they're cashing out before they sell. Um, so that's not necessarily the logger's fault. So um, when you're engaging a logger, you might wanna talk with them and say, here are some of the goals. Um, can you show me some woodlots that you've cut that way? Even better is having a forester um, in charge of your harvest. Having a forester is kind of like a, a buffer between you and the logger. They know how things should be done to achieve your goals, and they can see quickly when things are going wrong whereas you might not, um, especially as a land absentee landowner, you might not be there when the harvesting starts and you'll look at it and go, wait a minute, that wasn't what I was thinking at all. But we have done, uh, there have been numerous studies that show that people who use a forester um, as part of their harvest are much happier with how the harvest turns out and quite often they actually make more money because somebody is there watching what trees are going to what mill. Um, so that can be really important. Present use valuation, um, that is something like our tree growth tax law. And Julie, I think is gonna talk a little bit about that tonight, but um, you're being taxed on what your property presently is in agriculture, forest products, coastal access, rather than the full market value. So some of you may have lots that are in tree growth, and I think that's a great way to go if it fits in with your goals. It's not going to work for everybody because the tax base in your town may be low enough that you don't want to put that additional burden on the property because it does run with the property. Um, but it is something to discuss with your district forester and they can give you the ins and outs of tree growth tax law. There are certain measurements that we're going to be talking about in the class too. One of those measurements is diameter at breast height and that is measuring the tree at four and a half feet above the ground. Usually you'll hear a forester say DBH and we start talking about that with landowners and and we forget that you don't know what it is but it does mean diameter at breast height, and this can vary on, on any tree depending on where it's located and what types of irregularities there are. So in general, um, it is measured on the high side. It's measured from the ground to four and a half feet up. Um, if a tree forks, then you need to measure a little bit lower if it forks right 
at four and a half, or if it uh, if it forks right at four and a half, you actually drop down and then measure up three and a half feet. So you're actually measuring two individual trees instead of one. Uh, that one on the lower right has some significant butt swell. So you wouldn't want to measure it at that swollen part because you would get a very different view of how much uh, lumber you had in that tree if you did that. So DBH, that's going to be another term that you're probably going to hear a fair amount in this class. Basal area is another one that we toss around a lot. And basically, there are two different types of basal area that we discuss. One of them is the cross-sectional area of a single tree. And the other is the cross-sectional area of all the stems per unit of land area. And usually we talk about um, per acre, 60 square feet per acre. Um, so um, a 14 inch diameter tree equals about one square foot of basal area. So here's a pretty decent diagram of what basal area is. We measure up to DBH, remember that's four and a half feet above the ground, and then we would cut that tree off. And the basal area of a single tree is the, the area of that cookie right there. Um, so if you measured that flat surface, then you would have the basal area of a single tree. If we're talking about an area-based representation instead of a single tree, this is four different representations with 60 square feet of basal area. So that's taking all the trees that are in an acre and cutting them off at four and a half feet and then measuring the face where we've cut it off and adding them all together. So you can see basal area can vary based on the size of the tree. Um, six inch trees, you've got quite a few of them there. Once you get up into 18 inch trees, uh, there's only seven and it makes 60 square feet of basal area. And of course, the reality is unless you're in a plantation, um, you probably have pretty wide variety of trees, um, sizes uh, and diameters. So um, you're, you're gonna have somewhere in this range of trees, anywhere between seven and 50 trees that make up 60 square feet of basal area. Still talking about measurements, we have a cord which is a stack of wood that's four feet by four feet by eight feet. Um, and it contains 85 cubic feet of actual wood. Um, the air spaces are, are ignored. And it is the legal measure of fuel wood volume in the state of Maine. MBF is an abbreviation meaning thousand board feet. And that's what we use when we're measuring dimension lumber. Um, it takes about 11,000 board feet of wood to build the average 1,900 square foot house. And when we go to the mill now, most wood is actually sold on the basis of weight rather than cords or 1,000 board feet. When you buy it, then you start getting it in the board feet. Um, and if you're having firewood delivered, it's probably coming by the cord. We'll refer to various tree sizes while we're talking about things. Um, basically, when we're talking about a seedling, we're talking about a, a little short tree, not even three feet. When we're talking about a sapling, we're looking at something that's pretty small, it's between one inch and four inches in diameter. It's not really merchantable yet um, in most of our mills. Then the next size up would be pole sized, which is they're medium sized trees um, between four inches and 10 inches in diameter. And then um, a saw log generally has to be at least eight inches for softwoods and 10 inches for hardwoods to go and be processed at a mill to become lumber. Um, pulp are in that same size. Uh, they can be either poles or saw logs, but they're basically such poor quality um that they're not going to be sawn into boards or they haven't reached that saw log size yet 
Another thing that you might hear referred to is crown class. And this is a, a diagram showing what crown class might look at. Um, the Ds, they're kind of hard to see on the, the uh, trees, but this, the big ones with the very spreading crowns are what we call dominant trees. And they're intercepting an awful lot of light. They're, they're big, they're bold, they're taking up a lot of space. The CDs are co-dominant trees, and they're up there at the same height as the dominant trees, but they're narrower through the crown. Um, they don't get as much sunlight. They're not taking up quite as much space. The trees with the eye are intermediate trees, and those are not quite reaching into the top of the canopy. They're getting some sunlight right on the top of them, but in general, their crowns are a little bit squeezed. Um, those trees are not really getting optimum, um, optimum size for growth. And then the little S's, um, those are trees that we call suppressed. They are basically not getting much sunlight at all, maybe a little bit during part of the day. Um, they're growing extremely slowly. Lots of times their crowns are very tiny. And a lot of suppressed trees actually will not respond if you cut them. Um, if you cut them and uh, cut the other trees and expose these to sunlight. So um, overtopped is another word. For soils, we might be talking about nutrients. We might talk about texture and that's the way it feels. I mean, if you pick it up and um, if it's very slippery, it probably has a lot of clay in it. If it's very gritty, it probably has a lot of sand or if it's got round pebbles, um, there, there might be gravel in it. Um, there are some really nice um, websites that talk about um, soils, and I'll show you one in just a second. But wind throw can be a big issue depending on what types of soils you have, because if a tree can't get its roots down in, um, there's hard pan there, or if there's um, ledge underneath it, then you might get a lot of wind throw. So this web soil survey, this is a great tool to have. Um, you can draw your property. It has aerial photography and you can draw your property out. And then you can see over on the left-hand side, it tells you what types of soils you have there and basically how many acres you have. Uh, now it's not really exact. So I mean, like the first one there, it says Dix, Mont, Veristoni, Silt, Long, 4.6 acres. I would say it could be anywhere from say zero to 10 acres, truthfully. Um, but at least it gives you an idea of the types of soils that are on your property. And you can go and look at different tabs in this web page after you've drawn out your, your property. Um, and find out what kind of trees might grow best there. Um, you can also find areas where it might be a good place to put a road. So I encourage everybody to try this. Um, it's very user friendly, very easy to, to draw your, um, your property on there. I think you'd get a lot of information out of it. When we're talking about wildlife, which Joe will be talking about, um, he's probably gonna be talking about cover which is uh, plants that intercept the rain or a hiding place where animals can, can be unseen from other creatures or get protected by the elements. When we talk about forage, we're talking about things that can be eaten, bark, stem, leaves, buds, uh, gives the, the animals energy. Perennial plants are those that grow for more than one year and they either re-sprout from the root system or they reseed back in. Um, a lot of bulbs in our gardens are perennials, but there are a lot of other perennial plants out there. And then when we're talking about diversity, um, we're not just talking about plant or habitat diversity for wildlife, but we also like to have diversity in our, um, in our trees 
when you have a monoculture, meaning just one kind of tree growing, you're really raising the risk of having a lot of issues with insects or with disease. And um, there may be some variation over time. Certainly, you know, we have a season for raspberries, so we have good diversity of something to eat then, but the rest of the year, you might not have any foodstuffs on your property at all. So the seasonal diversity of, of these kinds of foods um, can be critical to the survival of the species. So you may see, I know we have a lot of oaks on our property, and unfortunately, uh, the deer don't come much during hunting season, but right afterwards, as soon as it gets cold, they're in there pawing for the acorns. So uh, we, we have a lot of deer certainly in the winter on our property because of what we have for habitat. When we're talking about harvesting, um, there are a couple different types of harvesting. There's clear cutting, which is a method that removes almost all of the trees. And there are a couple of reasons to do that. One of them is that it is um, probably the most efficient use of equipment. You know, you don't have to worry about damaging trees that are left behind because you take them all. Um, there are also a lot of trees that require full sunlight in order to um, regenerate and grow. So doing a clear cut in these areas might help those trees get established. Um, thinning or partial harvesting is a method of cutting out some of the trees and leaving behind others. And the nice thing about that is the limited resources like sunshine and nutrients then get concentrated into fewer trees. So there's less share. Um, it's funny when I talk with kids, they all seem to think that trees are very nice and very altruistic and they all share all the nutrients in the sunshine. And that really truly isn't the case. Um, they're as competitive as, as we are when it comes to goodies. Um, a harvest can be heavy or it can be very light, depending on the objectives, what you're trying to do. What are you trying to regenerate? What are you trying to um, get in there? Is it a, a wildlife harvest or is it trying to reduce um, and, and open up crop trees? Tolerance is something that you might hear, especially when we're talking about systems of, of cutting trees. And that's the ability of a tree to grow and germinate underneath the shade of other trees. So our beeches, our maples, our hemlocks are extremely shade tolerant. They'll germinate even under a very he heavy canopy and they'll wait there for years. And then when they get a chance, they're going to grow. But I'm sure all of you have noticed old fields growing up. And if you go in and start looking at the trees, you're going to see gray birch, you're going to see pin cherry, maybe some white birch, some aspen. Those are our shade intolerant trees. They need a lot of sunlight and heat for their, um, their seeds to germinate, and they're very quick growers. And then underneath them, some of those more shade tolerant trees will come in. When we talk about marketing, we're talking about selling timber or other forest resources that we have out there. Uh, gravel is one that comes to mind immediately. And knowing the timber markets is very, very helpful. We don't expect you guys to become um, totally skilled at marketing, but that's another good reason why you ought to use a forester in a harvest because they probably have a pretty good idea of what markets are available, what mills they could send the trees to, where you could get the best price. Um, so again, another really good reason to use a forester um, as a go-between when you're having a harvest. Oh, I had that in there twice. Interesting. Um, separation zone, um, you might hear that when you're referring to clear cuts. And and that is the zone that has to be left between clear cuts so that you're not violating the Forest Practices Act. And they must be at least 250 feet wide. It's not that they can't be cut, but, but they have to be only partially harvested. And for a very large clear cut, you also have to have 
uh, a one to one match. If you have a 76 acre clear cut, you've got to have 76 acres unharvest, uh, non clear cut as well to go around it. So that helps when we have a big um, company that is doing multiple clear cuts to keep those separated so that they all don't run together and, and become very large. And then just a couple of terms in water quality. Um, when we're talking about sedimentation, obviously we're talking about particles that have gotten into the water, which are very detrimental to our, our waters. And we try very hard during harvesting not to have anything get in there. Um, these soil particles can get suspended in the water or the fines might go down and cover up some of the gravel areas that are used for spawning for trout or for salmon. So we wanna be very careful about that. A lot of towns um, have adopted statewide standards, which is one form of shoreland zone, but DEP has shoreland zones and so does LUPC. Um, in the statewide standards town, no more than 40% of the trees can be removed in the first 75 feet and you can't have any openings. So that has kind of a double duty thing. It keeps the water body shaded, but it also tries to not change the composition of that area very much so that a lot of the wildlife that lives or travels or uses the edge of the water body um, are not as affected as they would be if you created big openings. And then the last term, uh, just a water bar. If somebody's talking about a water bar, that's basically a ditch or a hump that you put across a trail so that it slows the water down. The faster water goes, the more particles it picks up. And basically we wanna slow it down and spread it out. Um, you've probably all seen old roads that are just full of huge ditches. Stuff has run right down, uh, lots of big cobble left, but all the fines have washed away. And that's not good for our soil. Um, so we really encourage the use of water bars when you have any kind of slope um, just to get that water off the exposed soil and spread it out. So that was all that I had for my presentation. And if anybody had any questions, I'd be glad to, to answer them. I think everybody is on mute right now. So if you have a question, you can certainly type it into the chat. Um, if you're uh, comfortable unmuting and or uh, raising your hand, you could certainly do that as well. Um, but as Terry says, this is a good time for a few questions. And I see we do have some stuff in our chat here. People have been filling it in. Uh, Mort says, Joe Roy, yeah, that's good. And what my, will my woods look like? A great book, your district forester can get that to you. Um, and it talks about different types of harvesting and different types of equipment and what you might possibly end up, um, might end up seeing after a harvest is done. Uh, Jim, Jim Ferrante is our district forester out of Greenville and he says crown class refers to even edge stands. Good point, Jim. Um, Mort points out that web soil survey that um, lots of times your private consulting forester will use that when he's writing your management plan. Um, one of the best tools that we have to figure out what our soils are like. And yes, I was bad. I said LUPC and I didn't define it. Those are our unorganized territories. Terry, I'm going to interrupt. Um, there, there is a someone who has their hand up. Uh, Mary Moran, okay. Dr. Moran. Would you like to unmute, I, Dr. Moran? Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So, can you yeah. be give us a little bit more information about the shoreland zone? We have a large area of waterfront on a lake, Alfred Lake, and I'm a little unclear on what what you can take down i mean we have no interest in taking down much but we we've had some we have some we're mostly hemlock um mm -hmm. 
and we did just take one big one down that was pretty close, probably 20, 30 feet, but it was rotten. I mean, and then we get a fair amount of tree fall that goes into the lake. I mean, we try to take it down in the winter so it doesn't go in the lake. I mean, if it's go, if it goes down, I'm just, I just, I, I need more direction there. Okay. Um, do you know what town are you in? We're in Hope. Hope? Um, yeah, do you happen to know if it's, if it's a statewide standards are, town? I'm sorry? Do you know if you're under statewide standards? I don't know. Okay. Harold um, is our forester, and yep. well, I haven't talked to him in a probably at least a year, but he's he's been great. But I just I'm curious about this, what you can take down and what you can't take down. And and then this, as far as erosion goes, we tried to clean up a lot of the slash that's been on the sort of recreational part of our waterfront. We have about 2000 feet of waterfront, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to do too much, but it's it. It's really been nice to clean up a lot of the just usual fall, the stuff that comes down all winter. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, right. But we don't want to do um, too much to cause more erosion. Yeah, um, one of the things that is good is actually having some of that litter fall there because you don't want exposed soils. Um, the Forest Service handles timber harvesting, but if you're doing individual tree removal for aesthetics, um, that would be under the DEP. So a lot of it depends on what your purpose is. If your goal is cutting trees with the expectation that more trees will be growing back, then Maine Forest Service can, can help you with that. But if you're wondering, can I take down a tree so I have a better view, then that really is something that has to go through the DEP. Um, and they will tell you what, what can be done and how much can be taken down. Um, certainly nobody's going to stop you from taking down a hazard tree. Um, and you can get the main forest service out there to, to take a look at your trees and you know decide if there's something that's endangering your house. So is Maine Forest Service the same as having your district forester? Yes. yes. Okay, so I could call my district forester and have them come out and say, you should pay attention to this tree or that tree or, I mean, we're heavily. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, another suggestion that I that I might make, I mean, certainly your, your consulting forester will, uh, will probably have something in your plan that talks about how you're managing that shorefront. Mm -hmm. um, and that's often really helpful because ultimately uh, you you might end up having a conversation with the local code enforcement officer, mm -hmm. um, basically for the town. Mm -hmm. And if you uh, have have discussed this with your with your consulting forester, um, and this is part of your forest management program, then it's then it's a really easy conversation typically to have with your code enforcement officer and say, look, this is this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. It is not, you know, it is not, um, you know, purely to have a better view of the water or anything like that. We're managing the forest mm. um, as it's appropriately described in our in our management plan. And so check with certainly your district forester can help check with your uh, consulting forester and then either be prepared to have a, a really simple conversation with the code enforcement officer or um you know or or reach out to them and say hey um in case you're ever asked this is why we are doing what we are doing um, having that planned out and have the rationale a little bit clear is is often extremely helpful okay that that's really helpful because we we actually love our view without taking any more. I don't want to take another tree down. I hate taking trees down, <laughs> mm -hmm. but but um, you know, there's safety and is an issue. I mean, you know, yeah. right. So yep. great. Thank you so much. Sure. Sure. No problem. Um, mm -hmm. The question: Will the slides be available on your website? I'm I'm hoping that they will be. We are attempting to figure out exactly where they're they're going to be. Um, but the email that I sent you has that Woodland Goals um, 
attached to it. And then there's also a, a um, I sent you a glossary, which has many more terms than I covered in this presentation. Terry, there are a couple of good questions. Um, one, Carrie asks, if you have a smaller lot, 10 acres, or even just a few trees, are loggers or mills interested at all? We just had about 20 trees taken down or cut. Most will be firewood, but we have three to four large pines, about 20 to 26 inches in diameter. Yeah, um, a lot of that depends on the value of the trees. Certainly, if you had veneer quality trees, I think somebody would be willing to move in there and harvest it. Um, but with a smaller lot, lots of times you will need to maybe piggyback onto somebody who is having a harvest nearby because moving equipment um, is very cost prohibitive. So somebody's not going to want to really come there for, you know, 20 or 30 trees or a load of trees unless they're maybe working nearby. Um, although there are areas that have very small uh, you know, either they're horse logging or they have very small equipment that um, they can just trailer there under their pickup truck. Um, certainly those large pines are not, not going to be cut by somebody like that. Um, but if you're thinking that you'd like those pines cut down, it might be worth either talking with a forester or um, talking with a pine mill and seeing what their specs are. Um, it, it really depends on the quality, how many logs are in, you know, how tall that tree is, how much lumber they're going to get out of it. Um, but in general, I would say it's harder for a smaller landowner to get a harvest done than a larger one. If the trees are cut, um, then time is really kind of of the essence because uh, particularly pine, as the weather gets warmer, um, will start to develop some some stain, so it won't. Uh, it won't remain uh, marketable um, for uh, you know into the warmer weather. I certainly suggest you call your district forester in, in that case. Yeah. Um, Terry, another question, which uh, I know you noted that someone, uh, I believe it's Julie, is going to do a tree growth presentation in a, a later in this series. But the question is. Uh, uh, do wetlands affect the ability to be in tree growth? Um, can you harvest in wetland areas? Um, yes, you can. And and I see the harvest with regrowth intent underneath. Um, yeah, if those trees are over 20 feet tall, um, then it's considered a forested wetland. And you can include that in tree growth. If it's a scrub or shrub, um, then that land cannot be included in tree growth. Um, you may not have a regular harvest. You know, you may be coming back in on a rotation of every 15 years or so for the rest of your woodlot, but you might only cut in that wetland, say every third rotation, just because the types of trees um, grow more slowly or there's so much water that they grow slowly. But um, it, it depends on each individual wetland. But in general, if the trees are over 20 feet tall, um, then we, we would consider it part of tree growth. Uh, standard plot size for calculation of basal area. Um, what, what foresters usually do is they use a prism, uh, which is a variable radius plot. and so that means that a tree that's very large can be much further away from the center of the plot and still be counted as in for basal area, where a relatively small tree, um, if it's not very close to you, wouldn't count. Um, but um, you can do fixed radius plots too, where you just measure the Diameter, uh, you know, some people do square ones, some most people do round ones. And then the question, Terry, once the trees are cut in a lot, um, should people wait for trees to regrow naturally or are there programs to help replant different varieties of trees? Um, in the state of Maine, Mother Nature has blessed us with abundant 
uh, ability to grow trees and uh, just witness driving up and down um, the turnpike where they closed that uh, rest area and you can see trees growing right up out of the, the tar already. Um, but this is why you want to use a forester because your forester, different ways of harvesting can make it easier for different trees to grow. So for instance, if you were looking to um, uh, grow yellow birch, that needs a scarified soil. Uh, the seed won't penetrate down through the leaf litter. So you would probably leave some yellow birch seed trees there, but you would make sure that you drag the tops everywhere and scarify the ground so that that seed actually lands and has a chance to germinate. Um, that's not so helpful with other trees, which depend on the leaf litter and, uh, you know, can can penetrate down through it, but need that extra moisture. So I would say this is why you really need to get a forester involved and have a nice forest management plan written for your particular property and based on the goals of, of what it is that you want to grow. Um, Yes, scarified, scratched up. Thanks, Mort. <laughs> um, so like tilling a garden, because um, like I said, yellow birch seed uh, definitely needs to have some bare soil, no no leaf litter or, or vegetation on it. Um, that also informs what kind of equipment you use. So you probably don't want a system like a processor if you're trying to grow yellow birch, because that has a forwarder that actually lifts the trees up off the ground and then just drives. You probably want something that is a ground-based dragged system um, so that the treetops are actually dragging and, and taking some of that leaf litter off. Um, but in general, unless you're really trying to change something like you wanna make grow Christmas trees or an orchard, um, or nut trees, you know, sometimes you want to grow some of those things just for wildlife habitat or, or your own eating pleasure. Um, but other than that, I don't think in Maine we really need to um, need to plant. 